Well, he, 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 he's the commander in chief. Along with that comes a lot of stuff. Uh, and and um, our, our military leaders, the vast majority of them are America loving, oath keeping, flag waving patriots. And they're stuck with the choice of, of either following the rules, because if the military doesn't follow the rules, the military breaks down, or leaving. And we're seeing that, that some of both is happening. And um, Lord willing, and we do our job right, President Obama won't be there long enough to get his complete grips on, on the military and give the use of the Let's sit through this chapter, and then if, if we want to break for lunch and grab stuff to eat, we can have a big day. How and why ideological minorities make policy. The most insidious misconceptions are often half-truths. This is something that you know, but sometimes we need to be reminded. Within some factual statement, an important part is conveniently ignored, creating a false impression. Like the Hollywood producer who bragged, the New York Times has called his latest movie Colossal. Yeah, well, they called it a colossal flop, but he neglected to say that. <laughs> Democracy, majorities elect. Majorities elect. This conjures up the imagery of the preponderance of the citizenry elect our, our leadership, but in reality, it's a half-truth, a false assumption of major consequences. Majorities don't elect, and we're going to learn how. The truth is that organized minorities elect, always have, and probably always will. Most Americans have little or nothing to do with establishing national policy because they don't participate. We already talked about that. In the selection of the candidates and ultimately uh, make policy, uh, who, who ultimately make policy, a minority of voters do. And you are a part of that minority. Consider this. 300 million total U.S. population. 216 million of them are qualified or eligible to register to vote. Out of that, only 142 million bother to register to vote. And that was in the, in the very hot 2004 election. So that's less than half the overall population. In 2004, only 126 million actually voted. In the all important, important primary races where the candidates are actually selected, less than 50% of those who are registered put themselves to vote. See how the numbers shrink from 300 million to 260 million to 142 million to 70 million? <coughs> For us to understand that that's a very good thing. You know, I see passion here uh, with people and, and all the tea parties that I've talked to. We want to go and grab little petals of every citizen in America and shake them, wake them up, and get them to be a part of the process and to take responsibility and to do something. Not only is that not necessary, it's almost impossible to do. And it isn't needed for us to restore freedom. There are going to be a lot of people who we will never get engaged in the political arena. Understand that. You can like it or not, but that is a fact. The numbers shrink even further when it comes to the all-important congressional and state races. This is important. Judging by the public's participation, we can surmise that the majority of Americans don't seem to give a hoot about what their state senators or congressmen do. That, too, is a half-truth. Americans do care. Many just don't think their vote matters for much. How many times have we heard that? I'm just one vote. I don't have to go. I've got to go pick up the dry cleaning. I've got to go pick up the kids. I'm just one vote. They're not going to miss my vote. Yeah. This year, in the June primaries in California, there were more close elections that occurred than in the history of California. Mm -hmm. Number of races that were decided by 2,000 votes or less. Or if you compare in uncontested primaries where a Democrat and a Republican were running, and they weren't running against each other because it was a primary, but they were uncontested. The vote margins were so close, it's ridiculous. We all know that in one state Senate race, 
and on the Democrat side, a moderate defeated a left-wing radical liberal by 22 votes in San Diego for state senate. We have a Tea Party patriot who was the founder of the California Minutemen, who was elected in a six-way race in the primary down in Southern California in the Anthony Adams seat, the one that they tried to recall him uh, for voting for the budget. And this Tea Party patriot who, when they said, you have to do an absentee ballot chase, who knows what an absentee ballot chase is when a campaign tries to get, make sure that people who have absentee ballots vote for them. They send out mail and all this. He had to Google it to see what that meant. <laughs> he didn't have a campaign consultant. Up until the last week, he had spent almost zero dollars. Ended up spending about a little less than thirty thousand dollars to print all of his signs. He came from the smallest portion of the district, least populated in the mountains of San Bernardino near Lake Arrowhead. Most of the population was actually in Los Angeles County, in the foothills. He ran in a six-way race. One of the candidates, the one that everybody assumed was going to win, was a former mayor, city councilman. Two other guys were city councilmen. Other folks had political offices. Some endorsed by California Republican Assembly and, and, and different conservative groups and all of that stuff. And Tim Donnelly beat them all by 500 plus votes. So, I mean, I'm getting goosebumps, really. <laughs> thinking that he broke all, all the rules, just like you're breaking right here. He didn't know any better that he was doing everything wrong. Okay? He, somebody gave him a precinct, a precinct sheet, which he looked at and said, man, this looks like a home book. And they said, you gotta call on these homes, these are all Republicans. So he knocked on one and talked to one and said, hello, I'm Tim Donnelly. And, and, uh, and then he skipped the next 20 houses because they were not registered to vote or they were Democrat or there's some other party. And, and he'd knock on the next one. He said, this is stupid. So he just picked the neighborhood and knocked on all the doors. <laughs> and and uh, in very he said, I'm Tim Donnelly. I'm a former uh, leader of the, of the uh, Minuteman movement in California. And they said, well, how do you feel about the Arizona immigration law? And he says, well, I, I, I support it. And we're talking Democrats who would jerk lawn signs off of his hand and go plant them in their yards. They couldn't even vote for him in the primary. <laughs> His number one opponent, the, the, the son of a former assemblyman, long time assemblyman, his two neighbors on both sides of his house had Tim Donnelly signs in their lives. <laughs> you know, usually what a candidate does, what a candidate, one of the operatives will go through the precinct sheet when they're going to do phone banks, and they'll cross out the names of people that they know to be activists on the other side because they don't want to, you know, get them active to work against what they're doing. They didn't know to do that, so one gal picks up the phone and says, Hi, I'm Jane Doe and I'm supporting Tim Donnelly for assembly. The guy says, Oh, really? I'm running for assembly. And she says, Oh, yeah? Where? And he says, In this district. And she goes, uh, Well, we hope you'll vote for Tim Donnelly. Have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> the rules aren't what the consultants say, or the politicians say, or, or conventional wisdom say. The rules are what honesty, righteousness, truthfulness, straightforwardness, integrity say. That's what Tim ran on. And he, in this seat, it's a heavy Republican seat, so he will be coming up. But the Democrats hate the fact that he's coming to Sacramento, that they have got a, a college professor gal who's going to run against him, and they're going to spend a ton of money against him because the last thing they need in the state assembly is the first official Tea Party patriot um, uh, minute man serving in the legislature, being a thorn in their side. <laughs> For the first time. So they're going to waste a lot of money on him. And, and my prediction is that they're going to spend a ton. They're probably spending 100000 $200,000. And when they see, they're going to survey, and if they don't see the numbers moving, 
then they'll give up the ghost and say, okay, well, the nice thing about it is they're going to waste a couple hundred thousand dollars on him, and he's still going to come up here, and he's still going to be a flamethrower, and he's still going to have a bunch of people, tea party people from throughout the entire state of California. He is their assemblyman, maybe not the knuckleheads that represent them in San Jose or wherever it is that they live. He is their assemblyman. Yes. And they're going to keep his feet to the fire, and you know what? He's going to say, bring it on. I'm wearing my asbestos socks, so I can take a lot of heat. So, um, half truths, okay? Half truths. The important point is that there is a dramatic fall off in the numbers of people who vote from the top of the ticket president, governor, U.S. Senate, to the seats below Congress, Senate, Assembly. The fall off gives a greater leverage position to those who do cast a ballot and an even greater impact for those who direct and influence a sizable number of votes. Chico Tea Party, you influenced a sizable number of votes, more than 200 votes. You defeated the last vestiges of communism and the Board of Supervisors. Okay. Folks in Orville, in, in, uh, you're represented by great folks. You know, you got a couple of kids, I think, in the, in the city council, but uh, folks in Ray, Rock stars. We have rock stars representing us there. But the organizations are there to build people and bring attention so that they can understand that we need to help the Tim Donnellys who are running down in San Bernardino County because they will be our assemblymen. They will represent our rules. When they vote, they are voting for us. We already have the knuckleheads that, are, that we've already elected and, that, and, and they're already voting for us. So let's build the numbers. You are influencing those numbers by opening your vision to more than just what is in front of you, especially when you're already in a good place. What I call free America. You know? When I sneak up there, I have to drive through, through Sacramento County, and I always, I always joke that I have to go under the razor wire and sneak out <laughs> under the razor wire and come back up here to be, you know, God's country and freedom. <laughs> a classic example in the 60s, California Democrats artfully gerrymandered this is a, a very important illustration. The Democrats artfully gerrymandered the state. They did reapportionment, created more elective opportunities for their party. In other words, they ensured by the way they drew the districts. I mean, the districts looked like salamanders and dragons, where they would go down to Artesia and pick up a pocket of Democrats, and then they would go down the middle of the Golden State Freeway, down the, the center divide, and then they would open up to another area that had uh, uh, Democrats. And then they would go over to an area that was large in population, but most lots of illegal aliens, which count as bodies, but not votes. So they ensured that they had a majority of districts. They were always going to win. So they created uh, these districts. But in order to create more Democrats, they had to stuff all the Republicans into certain seats. They had to cram them um, in, in, in several districts. They had expected a particularly ineffective Republican assemblyman. Actually, it's the father. <laughs> the father of the guy who ran and lost to Tim Donnelly was this particularly ineffective assemblyman. Okay, they they thought he was going to seek the new Senate seat that they made for him. Okay, but at the last moment he said, eh, "I like what I'm doing. I'm never going to lose this before term limits. I'm going to just. I'm happy." So there was a mad rush by Republican candidates seeking this office uh, because they knew that whoever won the primary was going to be the, the senator. The race was in the primary. Okay, eight candidates sought the Republican nomination. There were roughly six hundred thousand people in this Senate district. Out of that, four hundred thousand could have registered to vote. Only two hundred thirty-five thousand actually did. Only 120,000 actually voted in the primary. 70,000 votes went to the Republican. 50,000 votes went to the Democrat. So the Republicans split the 50. The winning candidate won with 16,000 votes out of 600,000 people in the district. That is the reality of the numbers we have to work with. And if we understand this, we, know, we now know that we don't have to gain 70,000 votes to win an election. When there are a bunch of candidates in there, we have our conservative 